I got some good advice when I started Google. I was told, just to shut up. You know, for, for two months, just don't say anything. Just listen, don't talk. You know, you were, you've done some stuff outside of Google, we don't care, right? You, you're not good at Google until you su succeeded at Google. So for two months, just listen. And, and I took that advice, I actually stretched it to three because I'm a, a good listener, I guess. Um, and uh, started roaming around the company and, and test plans were one of the things that were really annoying me about, about Google. They annoyed me at Microsoft too, they've annoyed me, they've always annoyed me. I don't enjoy writing them. I don't enjoy reading them. Um, I don't find them particularly useful. And so that's one of the reasons I've been into things like exploratory testing. But planning is necessary. Some planning is necessary. If you don't, as a team, you know, we don't test software in isolation. We're not one person, one tester on a team at Google. We're many testers on teams at Google. There's got to be some planning and some coordination or you don't, you don't work effectively. So I got this idea of a 10 minute test plan. And it turns out that the 10-minute test plan is, is complete and total bullshit. I didn't expect it. My, oh, by the way, I do work at Google. Google is on the slides. Uh, I figure if Eric Schmidt and Larry Page can say stupid shit in public, I can too. Uh, so they didn't get fired. Of course, they would have to fire themselves. But, um, so, so test plans are a big problem. And you know, I went around Google for two months, and I, was, I saw some test plans were big, some test plans were small. Some test plans were spreadsheets, some test plans were documents. Uh, uh, some test plans had uh, lots of details, some test plans had little details, some plus test plans had drawings, some test plans didn't have drawings. There seemed to be no continuity. Uh, there were some groups that had test plan templates, so all you had to do was pull up this template and just start filling in the squares, which seemed to make people think even less about what was going into the test plan. Uh, and they didn't seem to make any difference. And then I'd ask the testers, so here's a test plan. It's dated suspiciously four months ago. Uh, show me what you're testing. And they'd say, oh, well, that plan's out of date. Yeah, I figured that out by the, dates, the date stamp on it. Um, so why is it out of date? Uh, you know, we got to write those things. And then we just test. So they weren't providing any real guidance. They were some checkbox that they had to tick off. And so I got this idea of, of the 10 minute test plan. Now, I never thought a test plan could be written in 10 minutes, but I wanted to make it clear. And the people who were in the room were people that I could directly fire. They reported to me. And I said, you're gonna make a test plan in 10 minutes. So I, I remember the, I played the Apollo 13 episode. Remember the Apollo 13 where the astronauts are up there and they dump the stuff on the desk and he's like, that's what you got, right? Fix the Apollo 13, that's the only thing they got on board. And the engineers had to figure out how to fix the Apollo 13 with just a bunch of junk on a table. So that was the idea. Take everything away from them. You got 10 minutes, that's it. That means, you got to throw away everything that's not absolutely crucial. And so um, it worked. Well, it didn't work. They, they didn't finish in, in, in 10 minutes. Uh, but they had no time for pluff, fluff. They had no time to write anything down. They had no time to format anything. It was basically just, here's the app, brain dump of everything we need to test. And then we started looking at it and trying to figure out, okay, what did they do right? What did they do wrong? Are there any patterns here? And then we went a little bit further with it. We did it again. So first time we did it, we did it on the Chrome Web Store. Second time we did it, um, we did it on an uh, application I can't talk about that I'm now managing testing uh, uh, Google's new um, uh, stuff that competes with companies that are doing better in that space than us. <laughs> uh, we did it on that. And uh, then we did it on all of Chrome operating system. All right, these are 10 minutes each. These are, and I scheduled the sessions for exactly 10 minutes and threw the people out when the 10 minutes was over. All right, big clock running on the. Uh, and, and so we, kept, we got better and better at this. And we never built a test plan in 10 minutes, but we did, do, we did discover the things that are absolutely important in a test plan, and we threw away the rest. And I'm going to show you what we ended up with. Uh, it ends up taking a little bit longer than 10 minutes. In fact, the first two steps take 10 minutes to get about 80% done. And then the next step takes about 20 minutes to get 80% done. And 80% is all you need. 
because the rest you fill in as you go along. There's no way you can get a 100% test plan done before you start. Things change, right? Things always change. Get to 80% and be happy. Stop. Start testing and then come back and update the test plan. So that had to be an important part of it too. It had to be easy to update. So, um, so this is what we did. Gave them 10 minutes, see how far they got, and we built a process out of it. So what's important? What needs to get tested? What really needs to get tested? Well, for, we started at this out when, when I was a test uh, director for Chrome and Chrome Operating System. And so for Chrome, what, what is the value statement that we're making about this software? Chrome, what is Chrome known for? Do you all use for speed? Chrome's fast. Fastest browser on the planet. <laughs> we wish that, like <laughs> Actually, we did. And we're close. <laughs> we're actually the fastest major browser on the planet. There are some small ones that are lightning fast. So uh, it's fast, right? It's secure. It's you know, a simple, intuitive UI. You know, n n no, no big fluff. Um, and so we, called, we, we, we started working with this. And we noticed that every time we did this, that's what we went after, these attributes of the software that really we're trying to prove out. Right? And, and we wanted to get to a point where, hey, here's 120 test cases that show Chrome is fast. And, and then next is, what is actually getting tested in the system itself? What are we really testing? What is Chrome made of? What is, you know, well, the, the one thing that's released is Google Plus One. Um, uh, what, what is it made of? Uh, we've done this on a, a bunch of, we did it on the Chrome, Chrome Web Store, as I said. You know, what is it made of? What are the parts? What are the moving parts that we're really testing? And then the third piece was, what does it do? What are the actions? The software, Chrome does stuff. It renders web pages. It plays flash files. Um, so those are the, the things that it does. So we, we decided that what we really had was this process of describing our system, first with adjectives and adverbs that describe the value proposition. Next were the nouns. They were the components of the system that made the system what it was. And the third thing was the verbs. They describe the actions that the system performs. That's it. I mean, if you're going to write a test plan, you can't leave any of that stuff out. The value proposition, what we're testing, and what the thing that we're testing does. That is the absolute bare minimum. Everything else we threw away. These are all that's are, that are in uh, uh, Google test plans, at least uh, the properties that I own in Google. And uh, it, it's pretty much spreading throughout the company. Sorry. <clears throat> Do you want us to ask questions while you're doing this or after? Go for it. Um, what seems to be missing here, at least for me, is, is our stakeholders. So it's interesting, why, why would you say you were able to throw away stakeholders? Because you've obviously been able to throw them away. Yep, we threw them away. So well, I mean, the stakeholders are embedded in this, right? Stakeholders expect Chrome to be secure. Stakeholders expect Chrome to be... <laughs> there's no one trying to say that, that, that it's not obvious and very often, kind of, you know, different groups of stakeholders are worth more than other groups of stakeholders. And ah. these people might expect this, these people might expect something else. So, the, so, so that, that, comes, that comes in risk, and it comes just in a couple more slides. Two, so give me, give me some time for that one. Two other bits that we might have really come to. Because effectively all the land is the what. Yeah, that you're going to test effectively, that's all the what. There's, what about the when and the who? So bear with me for just a that's second. Fine. Because there are some things here that are more important than others. And, and, and we've got to work that into the system as well. So this describes exactly what needs to be tested and why. Now, we call this ACC, Attribute, Attribute Component Capability Analysis. And it takes about 10 minutes for any of these systems, no matter how complicated they are, to come up with the attributes and the components. Now, in, in general, at Google, we can consume these from certain sources, right? Like Bugganizer, our, our database. As soon as you start a project, you have to do a Bugganizer instance. And Bugganizer, you have to identify the components of the software. So we can just suck those right out of an existing artifact. And we don't have to, we don't have to worry about it. Um, capabilities take a little bit longer. They take about 20 to 50 minutes on, on our, all of our different experiments. So for Chrome operating system, for example, it has 314 capabilities. And that takes a while to write them all down and think about them and, and figure it all out. Chrome Web Store has something like 26 capabilities. That didn't take any time at all. And so we're able to do this quite, 
quite fast. Want it to be more complete? Iterate. Stop at 80% and then, and then see, how, see how you go. So now, our internal name for this is Testify. What we're, we're going to hopefully ship this product uh, for GTAC this year. GTAC is at the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, California. If you read my blog, you know that. Uh, we're, we're soliciting uh, uh, speakers and attendee proposals now. Uh, Testify is the a tool that we built to document this. So we did it dozens of times with spreadsheets to make sure this is really what we wanted to do. You made the point earlier, you don't invest in a tool until you're sure what, what you want, want it to do because once you write a tool, you're stuck with it. And if it becomes the wrong process, people tend to be married to their tools. So the first step is to identify your product. Uh, and now this is important from a Google perspective because this tells us where all the data stores are for this product. We know as soon as we identify this product, it links with our project database, it knows where the code is stored, it knows where the test cases are, are stored, it knows where the bugs are stored, uh, and, and so this is important. Ignore this risk mitigation factor, I'll talk about that in a minute. So the second thing are the uh, uh, attributes. These are the adjectives and adverbs that describe the system. We list them. This is how many of them there are. I think this is, yeah, this is for Chrome operating system. So it's, fast, secure, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Awesome, I don't know how that one got in there, but there's not that many tests that are tied to it because it's small. And we write those down, and then the next thing are the components, and there's, here's the number of components here. All these blue things are, are components, uh, and you can jump around to them, and, and we, we write all those down. And again, at, at Google, these are just sucked out of our existing artifacts right into the tool. We don't actually have to write those down, so that saves a little bit of time. And then finally, the capabilities, they take a little bit longer. These are the actions, these are the things they do. Chrome operating system does 314 things, which, you know, it, it sounds like not that much. You know, if you think about, in fact, when we went to the devs and said, look, we did this thing called ACC, and it turns out your operating system only does 314 things. They were, actually, it was 309 at the time. And they were, ah, oh, you've got to be kidding me. This is an operating system. It's really complicated. You all have clearly left things out. <laughs> and they got involved in the process to help us, and that's when it increased from 309 to 314. They were right. We did leave some things out. Um, it, it, it's one thing to... It's one thing to guess at, it, it, if you ask developers to help you with this, they would mostly say no. If you go to them with an answer that looks wrong to them, they are definitely going to help, right? Because they want to fix you. And, uh, and, it, and it's, gotten, it's gotten them involved. So say, for example, playing flash content as a capability, we add it and it goes into this matrix. We tie uh, a capability to an attribute and a component. So when you're testing this capability, which attribute of Chrome are you testing? Which component of Chrome is actually getting hit when, when this test case runs, when this, when this capability gets tested? And so you end up with a matrix like this. This was uh, still in progress. Um, so all these numbers eventually add up to 314. And the next thing we do is what we call risk analysis. Now we can't, those 314 tests, each of those capabilities is going to have to be tested. And they're going to have to be tested multiple times, right? Play flash content is a capability. We're going to run a lot of test cases that play various types of flash content. So there's still variability in the test cases. But we're going to write a test case and we're going to write that test case against the capability. So now we've got a whole new set of, by the way, I hate metrics. I like visualizations. I like trends. I mean, metrics are dangerous because a number in isolation really just doesn't mean that much. But trends mean a lot. Um, and and I'll, I'll show, if I have time, I'll show some of the visualizations we're working on for this. We did try to figure out, okay, what's more important and what's not more important. And we did, we, we used the same trick as we did before. We sat around a table, we call this risk analysis, and we say, okay, that's not important, that is important, that's not important, we vote on it. Um, there's actually a numbering system that we have to do this, the tool, we all vote. Uh, everybody who's around the table votes on what they, how important they think it is, and the system itself figures out the actual number and then color codes it. Uh, the, this doesn't really show up, but there's lots of different shades of, of green, which is less risk, all the way up to red, which is more risk. And so this is our way of trying to figure out, okay, what's more important for, for and, and this is where we start talking about stakeholders and users and things like that. Um, so, so now we've got to, to a point where we're writing test cases. Now some of our teams do user stories based on these. They will take 
we'll, we'll say, okay, we've got 314 capabilities for, for Chrome. You take 10, you take 10, you, or you take all the ones associated with this component or, or associated with this attribute. You take all the ones associated with this component or this attributes, and then we start writing user stories. Or we look at them and say, you know what? We don't need to do any specification here. Let's just do exploratory testing with this set of capabilities. So the capabilities act as the guide to the exploratory tester. These are the places we want you to explore. And, um, and, and now we can tie that back, right? We know exactly how much testing has been done on the fast attribute. We know exactly how many test cases we have that relate to the secure attribute. And we can begin to talk about things like capability coverage. Now, um, let me show you some of the metrics that we're, that we're working with. These are, these are whoops, these are, some, of, some of these are experimental and some of these were actually um, doing in, in some, some major form. In fact, these are updated live. There's actually a spreadsheet that this presentation uh, connects to. And if this presentation is updated, this, and the spreadsheet's updated, this presentation's updated. So we can do things like this. These are, these are a subset of the um, uh, attributes, and we know how many test cases we have associated with each attribute. So we've done this UI testing a lot, right? We can do things like contour maps. This, uh, this is um, components and attributes, and this is the level of risk in those components and attributes. So the higher the peak is, the more testing is going to have to take place in order to mitigate that risk. I don't like this one, but I do like this one. Whoops, not that one. I don't like that one either. I like this one, right? That, that is a much better way of viewing it, and this is even better. Turn it upside down and pour test cases into each of these holes. So uh, during, this, during the testing life cycles, you're creating charts all the time to give you pictures like this? No. No? No, this is new. We've only been doing this for the last few months. Okay. No, these, are, these are generated automatically, right? right? Tools do all this for us. Okay. So as we test, you will see these things fill up, right? They'll, they'll, get, they'll get smaller. Uh, I'm a big believer in visualizations. I don't like metrics. I don't like numbers. I'm not, maybe I'm just not smart enough to grok them. Um, but I like, to, I like to see pictures. In fact, I like to see pictures move. Uh, the radar map, this is actually my favorite of all the visualizations. Because what happens here is, the, as at the start of a project, all of these testing needs all this unmitigated risk, right? It's all in the middle. And as you test, you're mitigating the risk. And these things just kind of float at, outwards. So if you look in my office at Google, I've got monitors all over my wall. And I've got these pictures in real time for every product that I'm in charge of testing. And so I get to walk in. And, you know, wow, look at this. <laughs> What's wrong with that one? You know, that's my uh, pirate. Uh, I was doing Johnny Depp. Did you notice? <laughs> and then you can click on these, and it'll, you know, if you click on one, it'll give you some information about uh, what does that mean? Well, this is, you know, this, the attribute is secure, and then, you know, there are 14 tests. We've got 85% uh, capability coverage here. There's two tests here, and we have 42% capability coverage as well. By the way, we're tying this into the code base so we can get code coverage metrics simultaneously with our, our capability metrics. And the Google infrastructure for testing is just like a playground. Everything is where it should be. Everything is accessible, right? Any tester can peek at anybody else's test cases, and the build system is open. As soon as a build occurs, you know, we know exactly the nodes in the data center that are hosting it. We can compare it against old builds. We can do all kinds of just way cool stuff. Um, I, I do like my employer. So there are things that, you know, we know we'll never get to this state where everything, all risk is perfectly mitigated. We, this is kind of where we start, um, but not really, because not all of these things are, are, are absolutely at their, at their worst case. So some of them only require a few test cases to get to the, to get to the border. Um, and, but th these are the sorts of things that, that we're, we're working on. So what I hope we've done here is not in 10 minutes, that was just a fake, to get people to throw out the baggage, but in less than an hour to be able to, to build a real test plan that's easy to update, has decent tool support, draws pretty pictures, and, you know, informs us of what's going on, but it connects the process. 
You know, no one's going to, it, it, any develop, in fact, the developers do weird things now. Like, they'll tell us, hey, I modified this component. You know, I just made it, had a big CL. CL's a change list. It's what we call code, basically. I just made a big CL for that component. You know, you guys want to make sure, <laughs> my, I, I want that number not to go back too far, right? Can you all push it out a little bit further? The developers are into this. They walk into my office all the time and just look at the pictures, right? <laughs> Uh, so say what you like about pictures, they do make people think. And uh, I showed one earlier, we're not doing this anymore, but we had this video game that was really cool. One of the things that pissed me off the, uh, in those first two or three months where I was just listening was the number of bugs that just sat in our, data, in, in our bug database and just rotted. You know, they, no one was fixing them, no one was closing them. So we built a, one of our enterprising Google engineers built this little video game where all the bugs were monsters and all the, they had an avatar for every developer. And every time a developer fixed a bug, the, in the bug database, we'd pick, that, we'd pick that fix up and we'd notice that there was a test that validated it. The bug would crawl over and the developer would you know, whack it to bits with his, <laughs> with his sword. And, uh, and the developers love this, right? They're walking by. What's going on? <laughs> why does that knight in shining armor have my email address on him? And you know, why is, there, why is he surrounded by bugs? And we said, well, those are the bugs that are open against you in the bug data space. And so, you know, they go fix them and then, you know, commit the change, run the unit test, and then come running into our office and watch, you know, they wanted to watch their... <laughs> Wait, we, I, I've, I've showed it in uh, presentations that I know are still on YouTube, so uh, uh, so you can you can see them you can see it live uh, on there somewhere. So so anyhow, that's me. Um, whoops, I don't like this browser thing you have here. Uh, that's me. If you want to uh, follow me on Twitter or email me or uh, read my testing blog, that's where it can all be found. Thank you very much. Did you have some more questions? Did you answer my uh, when and who question? So when we test is, is um, we test in the order of priority. Once we do that risk analysis, and by the way, devs really get involved there. They never believe our numbers. So we've got this voting mechanism. Devs can vote, PMs can vote, and the salespeople. They are by far the most important uh, uh, stakeholders to consider, especially in risk analysis, because they, they know what features are selling the software. Not necessarily what features are going to be used, but they know the features that they're going to highlight in their demos. They want those demos to work, right? So they vote up the features that, that they are going to use for their sales demos. The developers vote up their own features. The testers, I think we're a little more balanced on, on the whole. Uh, engineering managers, people can, can place protest votes, right? That risk is, that component's not that risky or, and then, you know, we have a little, we have little forums, uh, five minute forums. I will never let a meeting go more than, than, than five minutes. Um, uh, to, Google is a very anti-meeting culture. Uh, you get people, you get more than four or five people in a room, you better have a damn good reason for every single one of them to be there. Larry Page sends us emails all the time. It's like, we're meeting too much, we're meeting too much, because all of our calendars are open, so he can, he can tell. I get congratulations from him because I have a really open calendar. I don't do one-on-ones with anybody who can't fire me. <laughs> it's a policy of mine. So, uh, uh, and then the other one was when and who. Now, what was the who part? Who's going to do the testing? So at Google, testing, I'm, I'm, by the way, I'm writing my, my fourth book I brought in. And I'm writing my fifth. I'm here to sell something. I'm not just here out of the goodness of my heart. Um, I started blogging about why, how Google tests software. And I got in trouble for it, it turns out. <laughs> there are some things you can say as a Googler that they don't like. And so um, I, I uh, decided to the blog went crazy. I mean, they're getting lots of hits and um, lots of comments. Uh, so I'm writing a book called How Google Tests Software because now all that material has to be reviewed. And so it's all going to end up being might as well. And books are so snuggly. Uh, and blogs are not snuggly, really. I tried. Didn't work. 
So at Google, so I encourage you to read that because it's a long answer. At Google, developers own quality. And developers are expected to run a lot of tests. So we have this concept of small, medium, large, and enormous tests. And all small, medium, all small te tests and lots of medium tests are the responsibility of the developer. And if you get caught not running them, bad things happen. And then some medium, large, and enormous are the responsibilities of the testers. And we have this in-between person called a software engineer and test that is 80% developer, 20% tester, but the development they do is test code and test infrastructure. And um, so it's, it's kind of a celebrated role, actually. And you know, the pay scales are the same across all three roles at Google, and Google pays pretty well. So, um, Can we come over to you? Sure. <laughs> is We're place, hiring. Is there any place for manual, purely manual tester that they do? Yeah, but, yes, but. Um, we do have people who excel at exploratory testing, who are very good at exploratory testing, and, and they're celebrated for that. But at Google, if you can't code, even at the director level, it, it's career limiting. So, um, you know, I send, I, when I get really good exploratory testers, I send them to Python classes, um, make sure they, they know JavaScript. And we got this really good, I would like to release this one day, someday, but it's kind of tied into our infrastructure. We have a really good record playback framework for, for web tests, where we record them directly in JavaScript, and it's the best way to learn JavaScript programming, because you record it, and then you can make little changes to your test case. Uh, and you know that's how a lot of people, or a lot of my really good exploratory testers, become very good at, at programming. You know, the, so the certification argument aside, um, a computer science education is really good prep for being a tester, really good. The ability to program, the ability to understand the mechanisms by which the thing that you're testing works is really valuable thing to have. I mean, most of the testers that I really respect, people like Brian Merrick, are, are excellent programmers on, on top of it all, too. I'm not an excellent programmer, but uh, I used to be long time ago.